This is uh, really my uh, great uh, honor uh, uh, to welcome here uh, Professor uh, Paul Romer, in which uh, uh, Professor uh, Romer uh, uh, comes from uh, uh, NYU, and he is the he is economist and policy entrepreneur and co-recipient of the 2018 uh, Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. Uh, this is uh, uh, before N uh, NYU, Professor Romer was with Stanford and uh, previously with the University of uh, Chicago, and he's also an uh, entrepreneur by himself. So it's really a great honor to have you as a, a, a keynote here in the conference. Uh, please, Professor Romer. <clears throat> Uh, uh, this talk will uh, take the, uh, our break, we'll take it uh, 20 minutes uh, earlier. Please. Right. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm uh, so I have a lot I want to cover, so I'm not going to use slides. I'm going to work based on the fact that radio worked. So we're going to do the radio talk here. Um, uh, Isaac may be one of the few people in the world, maybe the only person in the world, who understood what I was trying to say about technology and growth and progress, and who acted on that insight. Now, to characterize what it means to understand, his reaction was basically, given this interpretation of technological possibilities, there's something really powerful we can get the government to do. So let's go do it, the cyber initiative. The reaction that most people, maybe almost everybody had, was very different, characterized, for example, by Alan Greenspan, which was something like, oh, innovation drives growth, and growth is important, so we shouldn't have regulation because regulation will slow down innovation. So notice they don't even agree on the sign here about government intervention. Either there's something great the government can do because of this understanding of technology or uh, government needs to stay out of the way. And what I need to convince you is that Itzhak was right and Greenspan was wrong. Um, now, uh, to do that, um, I, I actually was, it made me stop and think what might have been different about Itzhak's background, where he got the, got the message. Um, I think there were a few things that we shared in common, which meant that we actually understood each other at a distance. I, we had, I had no idea that he had read my paper and had used it to think, think about the cyber initiative. But um, we were both trained in physics so that we were comfortable with this idea of abstraction, where you strip away all of the context and just focus on the most important points. I'll illustrate that in a second. Um, he also was a philosopher, so he paid careful attention to the meaning of words. And I can't emphasize this enough. And finally, he had a position in a military organization, so he understood that there are bad actors in the world. Um, in many contexts, you can assume that there are relatively few bad actors, but it's almost like a discontinuity result, that if you allow for the existence of any bad actors, the way you think about designing a system has to be very different than if you just assume them away, as unfortunately, far too many economists are, are willing to do. Now, let me just try and say a little bit uh, about me. Um, in 1968, I was a young, I was a 13 year old, I was incredibly optimistic about uh, the possibility that Robert Kennedy could become the President of the United States because in 1968, this was very rare. Robert Kennedy was a white ma male who knew a black male and he was a, a public official. He, uh, he got to know a, a football player named Rosie Greer who had been just volunteering as a security uh, guard for, for Kennedy. 
and it was unusual enough that I, th I thought there was real promise in dealing with um, the race, which has been this you know chronic problem in in the United States. And I was really, I think, devastated by Kennedy's death, and by this sense that after you know half a century or 60 years of really quite you know impressive progress, things started to go badly wrong in the United States. My work about technology in the late 70s had the flavor of, gee, things are really optimistic, and there's all kinds of good possibilities. But it probably comes, in my own experience, partly from this sense that even when the possibilities are very, very positive, things can fall apart much more quickly than we realize. And if you just look at something like the homicide rate, in the United States from 68 through 1990. You just see this dr dramatic deterioration. And I'll mention some other examples like this. Um, the first paper I wrote in economics was actually about crime. Uh, I'd been, somebody had broken into my apartment when um, I was a graduate student in Boston, and uh, I realized later that this person had come in next to my, I'd taken my watch out of my bed stand that was next to my bed while I was asleep there. It's the kind of thing that wakes you up at that time of night for, you know, for, years, uh, for years afterwards. Um, so this may be part of why I paid attention to, to bad guys. In 1982, I uh, got my first job at the University of, of Rochester. I had no idea that anybody was going to pay any attention to the work I had done on growth and technology because it was a completely dead area in economics. So I was paying attention to a deregulation effort in the financial services area known as our savings and loans in the United States. Because of inflation, many of these savings and loans were bankrupt. The policy response was, well, let's try and deregulate them, hope that makes it easier for them to make money, and that will mean we don't have to bail out this, the savings and, and loans. I thought about, I was teaching, I had volunteered to teach a course on financial uh, deregulation. A couple weeks into this course, I realized, given the way they were deregulating savings and loan, I could go start a savings and loan. I could you know, basically take $100 million away from the US government, and it would be almost impossible to prosecute me. Um, so I mean, I thought about it for a minute. I mean, hundreds of millions. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, it's not a it's not a trivial sum, but eh, you know, I just just went about my 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 work. Other people had that same thought and did take money on that kind of scale. So in the aggregate, it was it was like billions. Um, the basic idea here is that when you have a deposit insurance system, if you make an SNL go bankrupt, it's as if you open a sluice gate and a lot of money has to flow out from the government treasury to cover the, the bankruptcy. So if you can just make money flow out of a, a government treasury, and all you have to do to do that is engineer some financial transactions where there's gains on one side and losses on the other side, that, that wasn't going to be so hard. So uh, it seemed to me it was going to be very easy to, uh, to, to milk this system. And it bothers me a little bit, like, why am I good at figuring out ways to be a criminal? I, I'm not sure that's something I should be proud of. But I also regret that it, uh, sorry? Yeah. But, uh, but I also regret that I didn't try and say something about this, because, you know, it costs, you know, like hundreds of billions of dollars to really deal with this problem in the United States. But I don't worry about that too much, because in 19, 82, no one would have listened to me if I'd said something. And I'll try and show you, I think even today, no one will listen to me when I say something about this. I wrote a paper on this in 1990 with George Akerlof, who's the husband of Janet Yellen, who's now our uh, Treasury Secretary. Um, uh, we called the paper Looting the Economic Underworld of Bankruptcy for Profit. Uh, which is a pretty lurid title, but it, it suggests a focus on bad actors. Um, our colleagues, this is in 1990, after the thing I anticipated has already happened, 
And, you know, most of the people I talked to just, just dismissed it. It's like, oh, you know, people aren't generally that bad. I was part, we were trying, partly trying to say, look, people will drive these things bankrupt on purpose. They will make losses on, pur on purpose because it will generate profit for them. And the reaction was kind of, oh, you know, people aren't that, that malevolent. No, nobody will do that. Um, Larry Summers was one person like this. After the next financial crisis in 2007-8, Larry said, you know, Paul, I'm now starting to think you were right. You know, there really are bad actors who will just drive one of these systems to the limit if you give them a chance. And so we, we have to be more careful about it. But at least in 1990, after the fact, no one uh, took the paper that George and I wrote uh, seriously. So um, I'm going to talk again about bad actors today. I think most of you are going to not take me seriously, but, um, but I think Itzhak at least will. Um, there's, a, there's a saying in Washington, D.C. I, I, I keep getting more and more cynical, but it's so hard to keep up. Um, that's, I think, the, uh, the, the way we have to think about things. Um, there are bad actors, and in some ways, I think they're getting more, more brazen. Um, to, Keep going, I promise you there's some reasons for going through all this background. I, I was also a bad writer. I can remember, this has become like a joke line, but I remember saying this literally to myself. When I realized that becoming an economist meant I was making my living as a, as a, a writer, not as a, phys, not as a mathematician, because I'd been in physics before, I was really kind of like struck and knew that I was at a disadvantage because I'm not a good writer. But then I said to myself, well, look, if Neil Young can make a living as a singer, I can make a living as a writer. So you just work, work, work. So um, I, I wrote two models of growth. Uh, by the time I was done with the thir first one, my thesis advisor, some very well-known economist named Bob uh, Lucas, um, my thesis advisor had borrowed or used my model V1 and was pushing his own kind of version of growth based on the same underlying model, I could see that it was just wrong. So I just rejected my first model and said, look, here's a way to do it right. Um, he was not that appreciative of my saying that he had bet on this, this model that was wrong, but I just thought he'd just do what I did, which okay, switch to a model which is right. I mean, what's the, what's the big deal? Um, he dug in, and it really became this long, prolonged battle. Um, he's a very good writer, and I was really worried that the kind of the truth here was going to get just uh, buried by his much higher prominence than mine and his skill as a, as a writer. Um, but that meant that I tried extremely hard to try and explain to him what was wrong with the logic of his reasoning. So I put a lot of effort into the paper that became... Uh, the one that, that it's like read. And so I think it's the best written paper I've ever written just because I kept assuming that the problem with my thesis advisor not getting a basic logical point was that I just hadn't explained it well enough. Um, uh, I'll come back to that point in a minute. Um, so uh, a few years later, uh, I'll come back to it now, a few years later, um, I had actually a direct confrontation with my thesis advisor where I um, was at a public meeting, the American Economics Association. It was also a published session, so there were no referees that were going to get in the way of what I was going to write. And I just wrote and said, you know, this is what, you know, he's written in this other paper is just simply wrong. And, you know, we, we just got to admit it. We can't pussyfoot around about this. He was... Uh, He's very highly esteemed, a very well-regarded Nobel Prize winner. Um, my wife, who's not an economist, observed this session and has helped me understand something about it that I didn't realize. I just thought this is like this is like academic, hard-headed discussion to just figure out what's the logic, what's true here, and what's false. Uh, but in fact, what what I ended up doing was exposing this person as a fraud. Um, I, I think really my thesis advisor and this whole part of macroeconomics, which was built around his work, is really based on a fraud. And I, by challenging him, really destroyed his, his career. I don't, I don't know that I would ever have done that if I had realized that 
at the time that he was a fraud. It's a very hard thing to do. I like him as a person still, but you know, at some point you have to commit to just what's true is true and what's false is false, and that's what drives this business. Um, my my first wife, not the one who observed this meeting, but was a surgeon. She used to have to sit down with people and say, okay, I've got your test results, you're, it is cancer, you're going to die within six months, so why don't we talk about how you'd like to spend the next six months. I was really impressed with her ability to have that kind of very direct but still empathetic conversation with someone. And I hope I can say things that with that kind of directness, um, but still with some, some empathy um, about you know people who are not uh, being honest about you know what the what the facts are. Um, um, let me just mention a couple other results because uh, again you're not going to believe what I say afterwards. Uh, my brother Tom is a lawyer. Uh, Tom had a senior partner at his firm say, "Would you go down with this person to a meeting in Atlanta?" Because this person wants to invest some money in a scheme which is offering very high rate of return. So my brother Tom goes down, listens to the story, asks the people selling the, you know, the securities or giving the right to invest, explain exactly how it is that you can offer these high rates of return. And he never gets a straight answer. He goes and he looks and he sees that the SEC is already prosecuting people doing, I don't think it was exactly the same people, but doing exactly this sort of scam. There's a whole story about subordinated debt and you know arbitrage opportunities and a lot of waving of hands. So my brother said to this, this investor, uh, look, this is, a, this is a traditional, this is a Ponzi game. This is just a pure scam. You absolutely cannot invest in this. Um, the investor was a Mormon and these people trying to sell him the, uh, these securities were also Mormons. He said, I trust them absolutely. You don't know what you're talking about. And he you know, just walked away, never paid his bill, and never, correspond, never had anything else to do with the, the, uh, the law firm again. So my brother didn't get paid for taking the trip to Atlanta. And now it's clear why his senior partner sent him to go with the guy instead of having the senior partner go. But, but it's, it's revealing to just go look at the SEC and see how many of these Ponzi schemes are being um, undertaken all the time. Um, now you'll get why I was leading up to all of this. I was asked to join an advisory, a scientific advisory board for uh, a cybersecurity uh, startup. And you know, I talked, I got a call from a headhunter, talked to the you know, senior VP, and they said all the right things. So we're gonna do cyber in a way where it's compliant with regulation and there'll be transparency and that all sounds good. And then, you know, Diffie of Diffie-Hillman is on the scientific advisory board. So, oh, God, that's, it's got to be okay, right? And then all these other people who I don't know their names, but they're the, like the, the leaders at Stanford in uh, this, these kind of proof of work kind of theorems that I don't understand. But, you know, it all sounds pretty, pretty sophisticated. But, you know, I just have this thing about, you know, bad actors. And I just couldn't quite figure out how this was going to work with this this firm, so I just kind of delayed. I didn't take any decisions. And then about two months later, all of a sudden, there was a tweet from one of the Stanford uh, computer scientists, like, I have nothing to do with this company. <laughs> just sort of out of the blue, trying to dissociate himself. I don't know if Diffie resigned, but they basically then issued a, uh, you know, a, had a new coin issue um, and uh, you know, just took the money and left and, you know, it completely collapsed. It was a total fraud. Uh, but at least my suspicion about the, you know, the bad actors protected me from being, being associated with that. So, um, let me leave all that because I'm going to come back to the cyber, uh, cyber currency stuff in a minute. And, and to just give you one other point, this issue about abstraction. Let me just describe um, an example of, of abstraction of the type that you know one would use in physics or that I find so helpful when thinking about these questions. The example, well, and the point of the, of the abstractions is you want to go back and forth between 
abstraction and what I call radical specificity. Use the abstract concept, then go very concrete and go back and forth. In optimal control theory, there's a description of something they call bang-bang control, which is sort of like driving your car where you just jam on the gas full blast, then you jam on the brakes full blast, and then jam on the gas again and jam on the gas and the brakes. It's not a good way to drive, but I think it's a good way to think. And so you want to go back and forth radically between abstraction and specificity. So the abstract concept here is, is just a, a, a function. Um, if you're a, a computer scientist, you may think of this more as a mapping, but it's a really incredibly powerful a, abstraction. You can think of y equals 3x plus 7 as an example of a function, or y equals 5x squared plus 3x plus 7, and you kind of parameterize uh, functions by the, the number of parameters that they, they have in them. Um, if you get up to like, you know, dozens or hundreds of parameters, you can start to get interesting functions like, you know, pseudo-random uh, functions uh, that we use to, you know, in, in all of our uh, cryptography. Um, there's a, you know, there's this notion of a Turing test that somehow something would be intelligent if you could fool a person into thinking it was a person. Well, with pseudo-random functions, you can fool almost anybody into thinking that this is actually a true random process, when in fact we know it's perfectly deterministic. I don't think fooling people is actually a very hard threshold, and I don't think it means, it means very much. And so what's the point of all of this? Well, um, there was this buzz a week or two ago about is artificial intelligence, is an artificial intelligence program that you, you the model that you've estimated at, at Google, is, is, this, uh, is this sentient? Um, and it, to me, it's like, no, I mean, the, this, this model, this estimated model, it's just a function. It's like a complex function. It's got like hundreds of billions of parameters, apparently, that they've estimated. Uh, and it's really hard to understand. It's even hard to understand, you know, pseudo-random functions. That's why the NSA tried to use the pseudo-random function as the way to subvert. Uh, like they paid uh, NSA paid RSA money to put in a bad random num number generator in um, one of the uh, elliptical curves that uh, RSA was trying to get people to use, and NST was trying to get people to use. So nobody understands uh, random. Uh, most people don't understand uh, pseudo-random functions. So God help us, how are we, how we going to understand something that's just vastly more complicated, like one of these uh, chatbots? But still, a function is a function. Functions are not sentient. End of story. So we can talk about complexity. We can talk about how much data it would take to estimate the parameters on one of these functions. But it's just, it's just pointless to talk about sentience, because functions aren't, aren't sentient. So you want categories like that or abstractions like that that just can quickly, um, you look at some specifics, you go back to the abstraction and say, no, it's sentience isn't even a relevant concept when we're talking about functions. Just give you another illustration because people were talking about COVID. I noticed, uh, because I was paying a lot of attention to COVID policy, that any time someone used the word need in a discussion about, for example, boosters, you know they weren't thinking about the problem right or they were being dishonest about it. Because any, any decision about something like boosters has to involve some kind of cost-benefit analysis where you're taking account of the, the risks. So it's not just expected costs and benefits, but a risk-adjusted cost-benefit analysis. Anybody who's using the word need is not trading off costs and, and, and benefits. So why am I telling you all of this? Um, I'm not going to say things that I think some of you will not like. Um, I don't care if you don't like me or you don't like them. Um, but I do hope that there might be a few other people, you know, who will listen and act on some of these things. Um, uh, the message is, is that technology creates variance. Okay, that's going to be a challenge. Technology creates variance. Um, variance is intrinsically bad. Okay, if, suppose you've got like a set of return opportunities. You can invest and get a 7% return what does technology do? It brings in this opportunity where there's some things you could do that could earn a, like a 10% return, but other things you could do that earn a, like a negative 10% return. Um, so if you just invest at random with this new technology, you're actually going to be worse off uh, with the new technology. So why do we think technology is good? Um, the, the reason is because you've got the option to invest in the plus 10% one but not to do the minus 10% one. 
So if you think of it from the options point of view, oh yeah, variance is good if you've got options. You just filter out the lower tail, trim the lower tail of the distribution, more variance gives you higher returns on, on average. But um, then the question is, well, will that filtering happen automatically? And I'm gonna just now shift back to examples and persuade you, no, it will not happen automatically. The market will not take care of this. It will not be the case that individual decisions will lead to nobody doing the negative 10% thing because the negative 10% thing will often amount to a cost which is imposed on others, not the person who does the investment. Um, so the point is, is that technology is beneficial only if you've got a mechanism that says don't do the dumb stuff, the bad stuff, do the good stuff. And that mechanism is, is the government. And used well, the government combined with new technological opportunities leads to progress. Absent a government which keeps you from doing the bad things, it's going to lead to, to regress. So what kind of examples can I give you? Think about commercial aviation. Governments have played a crucial role in making commercial aviation much safer than it otherwise would have been. And it illustrates a process whereby they do this. You can start out with something like a, a state-run airline, which can be you know, acceptably safe. It's easier to run a state-run airline than it is to have private airlines that you regulate and enforce safety regulation on. Regulation is hard. The government has to be strong enough to say, no, you cannot do that if it's gonna regulate, but have for-profit actors. But, but regulation is teachable. Uh, Boeing wanted to make more money selling airplanes in China. They could tell that Chinese airplanes were crashing at about 10 times the rate in, in the US. And so Boeing got the US to teach China how to do commercial aviation regulation. Uh, China's now as safe as the US. Boeing sells a lot of, a lot of planes. Uh, but it's the government in China that, that does this. Uh, think about chlorofluorocarbons. A new technology for making chemicals comes along. You make a lot of chemicals that are very beneficial. You make a few that seem very beneficial, but then it turns out they're, they're destroying the ozone layer. Only a government can say, no, you can't keep making those things, even if they're profitable, because you're going to destroy the planet if you do that. Um, pharmaceuticals. Uh, you can have a company that invents like things that reduce blood pressure or that have new vaccines, uh, antibiotics. There's all kinds of very valuable pharmaceuticals. But, um, but it's actually hard to come up with those good ones. Like the venture returns in biotech have not been all that high. It's actually much easier to do something like, well, let's just invent an opioid, which is, quote, um, a sort of a a slow, uh, slow release, timed release version of an opioid. And let's make, as a family, let's make like 20, 10, 20 billion dollars getting people addicted to, to opioids. This is what the Sackler family did in the United States. Um, and, uh, you know, they made a, they, they still kept about, you know, half, five to 10 uh, billion dollars from getting people addicted. And this has had huge effects in the US. Life expectancy was falling in the United States to a large extent because of the op opioid uh, epidemic. And um, the employment rate, the adult employment rate, has been falling steadily for the last 20 years. Uh, it's a few percentage points, but it adds up in a big economy, um, uh, probably because of uh, the same effect of the, uh, the cost of the op opioid uh, epidemic. So you can tell where I'm going to go. Uh, uh, crypt uh, cryptocurrencies are just garden variety uh, Ponzi schemes, they're fraud, there is nothing of value in them, and um, I wish more people had the courage to just come out and, and, and say this. At this point, I, you know, I, I, can't be, I can't really be fired or anything, so I'm, I can just say it as, as, blunt, as bluntly as that. Um, so uh, it's crazy, that, and it's crazy that we're standing by and letting these crypto firms engage in this kind of, and listen, when a firm says, we're going to give you 20% guaranteed returns, you just go read on the SEC webpage about all the Ponzi schemes. That's what they all do. So with this move towards the stable coins and then the guaranteed 20% returns, it's just garden variety fraud. It's like Bernie Madoff. And, uh, uh, but yet, governments are just paralyzed. 
it's high tech, it's innovation, we can't interfere with innovation, we can't stop these guys, and we don't understand what's going on. So the whole world is just standing there and letting these kind of frauds uh, play out. Um, I'm, I'm out of time, but let me just tell you one other story. Um, about a year ago, I got a bowel obstruction. Apparently this can happen sometimes if you have a right kind of physiology. Your bowel will just twist and you know, the bowel will die if you don't fix it quickly. So I woke up Sunday morning with a pain. By Sunday night, I went to the hospital. By 2 a.m., they've done a CAT scan. It's like, you know, we're gonna, you gotta operate right now. So I gotta think to myself, well, wait a minute. This person who wants to operate on me as a surgeon, is this like the Bernie Madoff of surgery? Or, uh, and I'm sorry, but is this like Google that wants me to click on the thing that I didn't want when I was searching? Um, or is this somebody I can just trust? It's like, yeah, you know, you need surgery, we'll do the surgery. The world is too complicated for me to make all of my decisions to protect myself from all of the bad actors. I want to live in a society where somebody makes sure that most of the time in practice you can trust someone who says, you need surgery, we're taking you to the operating room right now. And we used to have a government which could do that and we, we no longer do. And uh, when I was here a month ago, someone said to me at some point, quoting a line that you often hear in the certain political circles, well, have you ever seen a regulation that was, was effective? I mean, it's kind of like, is there ever any such thing as government which actually does something useful? <laughs> and my reaction was, are you kidding me? You're saying that in Israel? I mean, if you didn't have security services run by the government, this country wouldn't exist. So, so governments do something. And this kind of just casual flip, oh, government's always the problem, get the government out of the way, is corrosive and it's just logically incorrect and it doesn't correspond to the facts, but it's doing enormous damage. This was by somebody who I think came from Latin America. And what people in Latin America always tell me is like, we can't get government to work in our country. Uh, it's just, it's the whole system's broken. And my attitude now is like my wife, the surgeon, uh, which is like, okay, that's too bad. Uh, because some other countries will have a government. It'll do some things, like start a cyber initiative, and they're gonna make progress, they're gonna pull ahead. And if you can't get government to work in your country, you're just gonna get left behind. So I'm sorry, but that's, that's life. But don't tell me about how uh, this libertarian panacea is going to solve everything because government is always the problem. And by the way, that's the only point that anybody can make about why there's supposedly some advantage in cryptocurrency is that it gets rid of the government. So they've got the sign wrong. Thanks.